Welcome to the joint CAM and SPRI seminar of today. And it is, uh, my name is Gianluca Cusatis, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Bajant that will deliver this joint lecture. Um, there are no, well, there are so many things I can say, Professor Bajant, that I could spend the entire hour, so I will not do that. Uh, we all know Professor Bajant is one of the most accomplished, if not the most accomplished uh, researcher in our field. Uh, he's definitely the father of many of the things uh, that we do in concrete and concrete mechanics, fraction mechanics, creep, shrinkage, and uh, the what it, it is um, um, very specific to Professor Bajan is that every single year he comes with new ideas, and actually, actually twice a year at least, new ideas that then will make an impact to our to our community. And this has been going now for what 40 years or more. Right? Professor Bajant is uh, uh, has more than 500 papers, publication, peer-reviewed paper publications. He has received all possible honors that are in our field. As a matter of fact, I believe he has received all possible medals that are given to mechanicians uh, in, in, in our community, but two medals. And those two medals are one because one is Professor Bajan's medal, right? So he's, he's not eligible. And the other one is the Leonardo da Vinci medal that is for younger, uh, younger uh, researchers. Of course, Professor Bajan has still many years ahead of him uh, of research, but still probably too late for the Leonardo da Vinci uh, medal. But other than that, he has also many uh, uh, honorary PhD degrees from all around the world. And um, again, I'm thrilled to have him to present at this joint seminar. And I would like to join me in welcoming Professor Bajan. Zdenek. Gianluca, thank you for your kind, very kind introduction, or generous. And I appreciate the invitation to this joint seminar. It gives me opportunity to discuss what I think is a problem in computational mechanics, gap of experimental verification. We have two mathematically rigorous, thermodynamically consistent methods featured in a flood of papers, sessions, symposia, general polydynamics, the a phase field model, we'll called PF, uh, periodynamics are called PD. The problem is that experimental verifications remain selective. Out of many tests, people use one or two tests to check it. It, of course, works. Yet dozens of different types of tests exist. A model which is generally applicable must not disagree with them. Uh, regarding periodynamics, we published six years ago a theoretical criticism which was downloaded thousands of times. Curiously, no discussion was submitted, and it uh, was basically uh, basically ignored. Uh, so we decided to do, uh, show practically what kind of problems can occur, and that's my objective today. And I will compare phase field, periodynamics, and also with the crack band model, which is now the most widely used model in uh, civil and geotechnical engineering, and also actually Boeing and Airbus, uh, actually the only one. So the classical tests are listed here. There are many. I would go by one, one by one. And I would say they, except one, they all focus on concrete. And why we choose concrete? Because the diversity of available fracture and damage test data is greater than for any other material. And all other all quasi-bit materials, as we know, including polycrystals or nanos or micrometer scale, behave similarly. What I have to omit here is stress strain uh, checks of stress strain relations. That's also important. Dynamic tests, low duration rate effects, uh, they will not fit into one lecture. So I will focus on fracture. So first, one new result, gap test, which we found one and a half year ago, which sheds considerable light on the problems in the fitting of data and is a important check. It is simple, 
unambiguous. The point is that the standard fracture specimens all have negligible stresses parallel to the crack plane, and they have effect, negligible zero. So the gap test solves this in a very simple way. Uh, we take a standard specimen, notched, uh, and we install it at the ends with a gap. And that gap closes after loading pads, here plastic pads, compress enough. They, have, they exhibit plasticity, so keep the load constant, and that produces crepular stress throughout and leaves the process on. I will go quickly because I discussed it already before. This is picture of the test for concrete. Now we use size effect uh, to determine fracture energy and uh, material length parameter. So this is an example of the specimens for concrete that are tested. And the result of this test I summarize here is this. We plot here fracture energy normalized by the fracture energy at zero normal stress. So this is the crack power stress, sigma xx, and this fracture energy. According to all line crack models, LEFM, uh, cohesive crack model, XFM, there is no effect of crack power stress because it's, it's considered line, no fracture process on width. So that's actually grossly disagrees with this data. For concrete, the data indicate almost doubling. These are the points. Now I'll show two of them. One of them is for the stress measured on the pads, and it's slightly different at the, at the tip of the at the tip of the crack. It's a uniform view there, also shifted. And so it goes up and then goes down and eventually goes to zero when we approach compressive strengths. Uh, I should say that. Uh, this phenomenon is different for different materials, and uh, this is for concrete. Now, you might think, okay, so we, in a code for cohesive model or for LEFM, we just put formula for GF depending on the stress. But it would not work because it's damage, and damage is enormously past dependent, more than plasticity, history dependent. So I put here uh, effective K1, or actually rate, as the crack tip versus the axial stress and the data encircled by red would should come to the same point for different paths shown here so this is a significant difference here even bigger here these two data should be the same if there was no path dependence so how how can we model with a formula that would be that's not generally possible so we need a direct description why is there an effect well, uh, because process zone has width. A process zone in a quasi bit of materials is always cracking, cracks align different directions. When you compress it, you cause, you change the resistance to uh, slip, which is part of the fracture energy, in fact, in fact, the main part. And when the cracks slip, they uh, uh, cause the lateral expansion. So it actually causes width of the process zone to change. And that's the intuitive explanation, although it can be modeled by LDPM, of course. Now, we also get from this test characteristic lengths. I think it's the best way to actually define the material characteristic lengths. And again, same plot, but plot here CF. It's actually equal to, for concrete, about 30% of the Irvin's lengths. Uh, CF, uh, normalized. So, again, enormous increase doubling of this characteristic length as you increase the load and then it goes to zero but that does not mean process zone is zero but it is uh, has no resistance so this, these are interesting results now i don't use the word t stress because that's only for one direction which is using plasticity in fracture of plastic materials uh, i call it uh, uh, sigma uh, out of plane stress sigma zz which has also effect so you change sigma zz to 0.4 of the strengths or 0.9, you get big differences. So all these are data which cannot be captured by line crack models. Now, already people are doing these tests for other materials. So my former 
student and postdoc, now prof professor in Istanbul, has done many tests on aluminum, aluminum alloy, and you see even bigger increase uh, of GF. But, uh, and uh, very recently, it's not published yet, Salviato, who works for, uh, in Seattle, uh, prof associate professor uh, in, uh, for Boeing uh, contract, he found decrease of GF. So you, you see this contrasting behavior, different materials behave differently. This is his test of cross ply composites. And this is the test of aluminum. And they had to be stabilized against lateral buckling because we want to use thinner specimens. It's more convenient. Oh, okay. So now, which model will we compare? Face feed pyramics and crack by models. So I need to say at least a few words about their characteristics. So phase field is a model which first occurred in chemistry about 50 years ago to approximate surface chemical reactions, which actually essentially present heavy side step function. And it was distributed smoothly and then variational methods could be done to model it very effectively. Now in fracture, we have a line, so with the line crack, it's a direct delta function and it is smoothed out by damage, like this, damage parameter. And that damage parameter has the purpose of anchoring the line to the final element code to run in any direction without any bias. We know without, uh, normally there is a bias. So that's achieved by having a band of width of about four to six elements and uh, the damage uh, comes out uh, like this, uh, exponential function. The, and this is then applied to the elastic field, which variationally anchors the band to the, uh, to the right pace and uh, uh, propagation. It was beautiful. That's an uh, outstanding idea. Uh, outstanding idea of Frankfurt and Marigo uh, about 20 years ago. So, uh, the, uh, the fitting of the crack band onto the final element is done variationally. We minimize damage-free energy. Uh, that's part of the cracking. That's the phi is the damage parameter running zero to one. And this is a clever construct due to Frankfurt Marigo, which uh, must be zeroed if this is minimized. And if it's zero, it gives differential equation nonlinear, which has solution by double exponential spreading to both sides. And that gives a damage parameter and that's applied to the elastic field. And the algorithm is then is as follows. We construct an enlarged state vector x at time n minus one here, uh, which is, uh, uh, consists of nodal displacements and these phase field parameters. And we want to get vector at time n. So this is done by alternative minimization uh, variational. Uh, so first we minimize the elastic free energy, keeping uh, energy of damage, free energy of damage constant, taken from the previous step, of course. And then we take this elastic free energy as constant and minimize uh, the damage. And this uh, can be iterated, but if the time times is low, it does not need to be, and the coverage is actually very well. That's a, a very effective algorithm. Uh, this was extended by some people, like uh, Johnny Wu, uh, uh, replaced this uh, by slightly complicated expression to introduce effect of uh, some, uh, to mimic the effect of finer visible zone and also uh, cohesion. So now, how has this been verified in the literature? If you go to computational journal papers, they typically use just uh, just these tests and nothing else. So compact tension specimen is a basic specimen. You extend it and crack grows. So you measure crack lengths, a plot against crack opening, and this is easily matched by this uh, by the phase field model, uh, also by dozens of other models easily. And the low deflection curve can be measured, and that's also easily matched. Another uh, thing frequently shown also in the movies. Uh, is uh, dynamic fracture branching. If a crack runs at uh, about half of the railway speed, 
it's uh, the inertia effects cause branching and that's easily produced. The other model I will discuss is paradynamics. Now, paradynamics I consider as an extension of 1977 Burt and Dugill model. They call it network model. In that model, Dugill specified that each material point is connected to all material points randomly placed within a certain radius. Well, that's exactly the idea of paradynamics. And this is done for every point, so there are lots of connections. Uh, we are shown here for two central points. Uh, this idea uh, we have criticized six years ago. I mentioned that in a paper, theoretical paper, I listed a number of uh, problems. So I will not go through them because I published. But let me at least mention there is obviously a problem with boundary. Uh, in the boundary, you have small low density of corrections. So you need to do something increase uh, the strength of the connections or energy of the connections, but uh, strength and fracture energy cannot be done both, so you never do, uh, there's no perfect solution. Uh, what is the main problem in reality? You don't have particle skipping potentials about the atomic scale. Uh, uh, for example, in reality is some material particles. Into my mouse somehow. Oh, I see, okay. A uh, central particle is connected to boundary particle, not by potential directly, but through intermediate particles. And important point is that they rotate and have shear. So shear is very important actually. Uh, and that's a different behavior as actually basis of another model, LDPM, a little bit Northwestern by Cusatis. Uh, the problem is, uh, it's not appreciated, it's actually especially severe at cracks. So if you have a, so boundary already discussed. So if you have a crack, then should D point interact with point D double prime? Of course not. So you have a boundary problem here, same as before. You have to cut it off. A, a far ahead of the crack, you have full interaction. But what about in the process zone, which is in concrete about one foot long? So should B interact with B double prime? Well, if it's very close to the front, there's little damage, then it probably should almost fully. If the B is B double prime is located here in the back, then obviously almost not. So there should be gradual change that has never been considered, but it's it's significant effect. So that's uh, one unsolved problem in paradynamics. There have been various improvements. So uh, recently, uh, Basilevs with Foster and Bernard Sabat discovered that in the state-based model of paradynamics there was a small error in the formation gradient calculation and we developed corrected calculations with corrected deformation gradient i will not go into into details it's published and what we will consider in simulations the usual verification of paradynamics were dogon specimens in tension uh, with or without a hole so there was international exercise, uh, Sandia challenge called, that's it. Uh, uh, and uh, what is uh, measured is uh, how the crack evolves and also low deflection curve. And the same again, paradynamics can fit this dynamic effect very well, branching for a fast crack. And these are basically the corrections that are available in the literature. Oh, there is also another correction actually, uh, I should say for for phase field that you mentioned it. Uh, what is also done is a compact tension specimen you uh, pull apart and you drill a hole as on the side of the straight extension. So obviously it will cause the crack to curve, to curve, uh, to run into the hole. Phase field does it beautifully, paradynamics too. Now crack by model I show here. Crack by model uh, would do a rugged crack but it basically for this correct result a low deflection is undistinguishable it's it's correct for practical purposes too but not as smooth now i will use uh, in the crack brain model the micro brain model let me say a few words there's a model developed at northwestern in the early 1980s went through several improvements the latest one uh, m7 m1 m2 up to m7 that's what we use but the basic idea is that there are weak places in the material 
uh, and this on the, we resolve the strain into a vector on that plane projection which is a component shown here and if you deal, deal with vectors for example for the normal part you can uh, relate it to, uh, uh, to tensile cracking distributed uh, if for the compression part you can relate it to uh, splitting and spreading for the shear you can relate it to shear slip so you can bring in physical ideas which in tensile setting uh, with loading surfaces you cannot do now you need to cons uh, the okay the algorithm you go from this continuum strain or macro strain uh, uh, by kinematic state to the micro strain uh, and then you have must have vectorial micro equation based on these physical ideas you get micro stress and these need to be assembled into macroscopic stress that's done variationally by principle virtual work uh, that requires integration over all spatial directions over unit sphere and that's uh, that has to be done by gaussian integration optimal and uh, the minimum number necessary is 21 microplanes uh, in discrete form uh, which are normal to these points here but in practice we use 37 uh, it's of course more computational work instead of going straight by classical tensor model here we go through the micro uh, but uh, for large computer programs it makes no difference so i'll comp compare seven models uh, crack band with m7 crack band and uh, we put on his best tensorial model with loading surfaces invariance for concrete i believe it is grassel i think it is better than our old models and, and northwestern uh, so that was that we implemented here then we have phase field model original i described improve, improvement by wu i also mentioned and peridynamics the original uh, model by ceiling uh, uh, with fracture energy control by both stretch and then we introduced, uh, took two more models now i gave a talk on this subject much shorter and fewer results at asme i got discussions of course from sandia and i was told oh you use our, the program which is on our on our website and sorry is not state of the art i have a program which is work very well and the point is you must use better material model because the problem is that program is not public i was not able actually get it also not the material material model so anyway so i decided what material can do so we put best tensor model on it uh, so uh, we uh, put on the periodic code the grasses model this is the best one in tensile form actually basil f has m7 on it already and then we put the port bond associated this is the corrected deformation gradient but with grasses model so these are the models which i will consider in the simulations now the comparisons so most important for fracture especially quite a bit of materials to open the size effect Size effect determines fracture energy, and if it's a, uh, it also determines material characteristic lengths, and unambiguously. Uh, there was an idea, uh, came up in Northwest 1984, and a few years later extended that to the size effect law, nominal strength of structure, uh, uh, parameter, dimensionless, uh, tensile strength, structure size, divided by transitional size and that can be related to fracture mechanics by introducing dimensionless energy release rate as a function of relative crack length alpha zero is at initial crack length here is fracture energy and here is the characteristic length and now this formula has been derived by asymptotic matching you do asymptotic expansion of as the uh, in the uh, near, uh, uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics you can get easily the first two terms of that expansion uh, you do on the ductile side you get asymptotic expansion also two terms so four asymptotic step to match and they are matched by this virtual by only this formula not, not none other i should explain however this diagram so 
This shows the plot of this formula. This is the blue curve called size effect law, SEL. And it plots, it shows the uh, sigma in logarithmic scale as a function of size in logarithmic scale. Now, property of linear elastic fracture mechanics that uh, the, the curve is a straight line or slope exactly minus one half. Now, uh, here's this transition here. You see the data here, they are from recent tests by Hur and Northwestern, uh, which has a big range of small scatter. And you see that uh, Craigburn M7, Craigburn Grassl, both match very well. Grassl is the black, the green is the uh, M7 model. However, the models by uh, Perida uh, face field model and uh, and uh, modified by Wu don't match well. In fact, they seem to give power law, but power law not exponent one half. And it is known that if exponent is not minus one half, then the uh, energy release rate into the process only is zero or infinite. Zero in this case would be zero. So that's actually self contradiction uh, right, right here, theoretical. Now the same, same, the same plot. By showing different models. So this is Grasso, uh, modified, uh, uh, bond associated, uh, uh, periodynamics here uh, actually stops this effect, which is impossible. Uh, so these are incorrect. Uh, now, there is another type of side effect when you don't have a notch. Fracture starts when it when a sufficient process zone is developed, basically RVE size. So the process zone grows, and that causes also transition, but much weaker. So it's a that's asymptotic formula realistic here published, of course, derived asymptotically for asymptotic properties, and uh, it gives a curve which flattens eventually to viable side effect, uh, statistical, but not in this range. So statistics cannot intervene here because you have only one possible choice for material failure, not many choices to take statistical uh, conclusion. And you see the data here, typically these kind of data are more scattered, but there is a clear trend. This is the mean, formula fits the mean. And again, uh, CBM7, uh, and uh, Grassl fit as well as the data of scatter permits. And, uh, uh, and the other models are in gross disagreement. Uh, uh, face field model and actually the, the stopping of the effect prematurely is, uh, is impossible. The same data again plotted, but other models shown here. So uh, this is Peridaramis, Grassl, M7, uh, bond associated goes, goes completely wrong. Uh, Paradynamics, uh, this curvature is not right. Actually, fair. you cannot get beyond this point. So, okay, so these are unsatisfactory or, or wrong, actually. If you now, there is an interesting point. I was very pleased to see a paper by Hobbes from Cambridge three months ago. He was the first person in paradynamics to even consider side effect. First. And uh, but he did test both notched type two, unnotched type one. They are shown here, notched and unnotched. But he plotted them in linear scale. Now linear scale obscures what's happening, and we concluded there are deviations due to scatter, and the scatter may be statistical, but it cannot be statistical because statistical side effect is much larger sizes. Now we did not do any calculations. We took the data from his paper, placed them here in a log log plot, and you see beautifully agrees with the size of the curve. Also type one, the slope is of course much less. And then here, one over two, one over seven. And we plot uh, uh, here, uh, oh, all right, and his data are, are deviating. Here, not so much. These are uh, Hobbes data, uh, uh, Hobbes uh, and Hobbes analysis, and it was bone based periodic This is the original one. And here it gets no effect at all. So this is, this cannot be, of course, statistical. That uh, simply doesn't work. Now, what is also important is to look at the picture of damage. I will show damage plots only for the maximum load states. So 
uh, the damage uh, for M7 is what, it, what you expect, what you actually see also in observations. Uh, here uh, uh, also uh, what you see in observations. Phase field is basically correct here. Uh, 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 this is for, uh, okay, for Wu is uh, also reasonably good. This one is too long for Wu. If you take uh, other, other models, so this is the peridynamics. Uh, this is obviously wrong. This spreading out is not there, and this is one explanation why it does actually does not work. You can correlate uh, correlate these pictures with the with what's happening. And Peter Grosser, okay. So uh, the other models don't work or uh, well or don't work at all. Now another interesting and I think important test, which has been totally overlooked, we tested in Northwestern 1986 concentrated shear fracture. It's a four point loading and normally you put these loads farther away from the notches and then you get two cracks diverging apart curved mode one. When you put the notch close, uh, then you produce perfect mode two crack. Why? Because the person, uh, zone of very high uh, strain energy is very narrow. Uh, so you uh, reproduce it perfectly with uh, Kribler model M7, also Grassl, uh, with uh, phase field, not too well, actually should not go here. Uh, with phase field Wu, actually you do it quite well. For very dynamics, Grassl, uh, you get uh, completely wrong. So, uh, and uh, for uh, bone associated, uh, you, you get it reasonably well, you get it good. Another test which has been overlooked, uh, Northwestern we tested in uh, 1990, compression torsion. So we take a specimen, put under compression, and then uh, apply a torque, and we do two cases, with compression and without. If there's no compression, and there is a circumferential notch, the torsion results in perfect mode three crack, plane. Now, if, you apply compression about 40% of the strength, you get a cone. And that cone angle varies with the, with the load. And uh, you get pictures then, which are shown here for the damage patterns. So M7 indicates appearance of a cone. Actually, if you run it, this is maximum, maximum old state. If you run it to the end, you, you will see a, see a cone. In this case, you'll see a flat crack, exactly. Grassel got flat crack. Now, CB Grassel, not quite well because this damage should not be there. It's, uh, and with very, very, very high load, uh, you get uh, actually cylinder. Now, uh, uh, face field, wrong results. Face field rule, wrong results. The same thing for other models, for peridynamics, this is a nonsense. This is also a nonsense. Uh, uh, bond associated peridynamics uh, gives uh, also incorrect results. Another test. Now, the basic test in concrete done at every construction site is unaxial compression test, basic check of quality. Curiously, it was not studied in compression literature. Now, this test. If it's uh, if friction is allowed on the uh, on the top surface, fails by inclined shear band, as you see say here, schematically here, possibly multiple shears. So Kerber model does it very well. Kerber Brazil almost well. It should not be so thick at maximum load. It should be more concentrated. Phase field wrong. Phase field wrong. Peridynamics. All these are, are incorrect. If you look at the low deflection curve. So this is typical low deflection curve in compression done in a stiff machine with servo control that did not exist before 1960s, that was discovered at the time. So uh, Kerber model M7 match as well. Kerber and Grassel does correct peak, but too fast down with the tensile model. Uh, uh, Board associated peridynamics is also too fast down. Pre-dynamics drops the steeply down, which is incorrect. So this is all poor. 
also the patterns. Another test, and that was not done for concrete, but for sandstone. Uh, a slab which is confined at zero transverse strain, rigidly placed slabs, is loaded by control displacement vertically and is under different confining pressures from the side. Is zero, uh, is different pressure, so uh, wait a bit. Uh, different values, okay, so diff different values. Oh, here, zero or N8 MPA. So you get this pattern which agrees uh, well with the experiment, or this at high load, you get, uh, you get this. Uh, now, Kerben Russell, this is correct, but this is, this is not really correct. Uh, Perina, uh, face field, completely wrong. Face field rule, uh, wrong. There's an interesting improvement by Professor Chu from Korea which I don't have time to discuss, but we ran it for this case. And that also uh, seems to work here, but not for high, high compression, only for the low compression. You look at the low deflection diagram. Again, you see that the peak is, well, you see the scatter here. This is, uh, is partly partial instability. Uh, uh, model M7 does okay. Uh, K-band Grasser not. Uh, well, actually, it does here. Yeah, okay, it overshoot that's not bad, and but it goes straight down, which is not, which is not right. Uh, we know it's, uh, it should have long long tail, softening tail, and this is at zero uh, uh, zero confinement, so a lower peak. They could not somehow run it, run the post peak, but anyway, this is post peak, and here the other models drop suddenly down. Even some get the wrong peak. So again, these models are performing incorrectly. Uh, now the same uh, picture is done for other models. P.D. Grassel, uh, same, di same diagram. Uh, these curves, you see they don't work. And you can see in the diagrams that uh, the pattern of damage are incorrect, uh, as you see here. Uh, P.D. Grassel gives nothing here. Uh, uh, the PD were associated, so uh, incorrect. So all these models fail this test. Now, confined compression oscillator, perfectly confined. Uh, that's not a fracture test, but it's very important for penetration of missiles into con concrete or rock walls, because at the moment of penetration, material is under enormous pressure, many times higher than unix compression stress, and creates a zone which is basically plastic, it displays lots of energy, and only then fracturing starts. So uh, we studied that extensively in Northwestern, and these are tests from we did here in, uh, with Bishop in 1980s. Tungsten carbide vessel, extremely rigid, small hole, one inch, we fill it with small aggregate concrete. We put a copper foil as lubrication, and uh, uh, press it later, uh, axially, and you get this kind of low reflection diagram. So initially, uh, unaxial compression strength is about here. Uh, it's greatly extended scale. That goes to 300,000 PSI, or 2,500 MPA. Uh, then you have void collapse, so the curve flattens, but no softening. When voids close, it straightens up, and eventually gets back stiffer than at the beginning, about double, double elastic modulus. Now, Craig Ben model was calibrated to do this. Uh, uh, so, uh, PD Grassel also does reasonably well. And Craig Ben Grassel, uh, okay, won't associate it. Uh, it's okay at the beginning, but then it uh, goes off. This is not correct. Paradynamics and phase model, totally wrong. No fail. So, now another. Test which is overlooked and also ignored actually metals. We know that if there is a theory of plastic damage with loading surfaces, the loading parallel to the loading surface must be elastic. All right, so if you take a cylinder and load it axially and then apply torque, so this axial strain apply torsional moment M. We'll look only at the initial stiffness. So at various levels, before peak, at peak, after peak. And according to every model with loading surfaces, 
it, sh uh, it should be uh, it should be elastic except if there is a vertex if two surfaces interact at that point but in uh, compressions are no two surfaces intersecting here now this is not true of course and it was found already by Budjanski for metals with Berdorf in 1950s debated a lot then ignored because it was a inconvenient uh, problem and uh, then about 20 years ago Ken and I showed it in Northwestern, tested it, and we showed there is enormous effect even more than for metals. So, initial torsional stiffness is here, uh, according to models with loading surfaces, is no effect. This is uh, about half of the strength here. This is at the maximum at the peak point. This is the softening range. You see the data, the blue points, enormous decrease. It goes about 20% of the strength here, uh, about 40% down. Uh, Craig Ben model, M7 models that well, Craig Ben Russell 2, and you see the pictures also are reasonable here for various stages loading before peak, peak, after peak for both these models. But if you take phase field, you take phase field rule, completely wrong and missed. Uh, more for the same diagram, uh, if you take Craig Ben Russell, does that. As a poorly, the, I mean, the, the diagram was correct, but the pattern is not right of, of the failure. It should be helical curve. Uh, and this, uh, this is a wrong, wrong pattern. Uh, bond associated with wrong. This one is uh, uh, also also wrong. Very dynamic with Russell's model. Now I'm coming to a fracture problem, uh, which I consider the most difficult fracture problem I encountered. Sheaf fracture of reinforced concrete beams. This shows the left half of a beam, end support, load, and there is a bar which is anchored, steel bar, which prevents slip. And we know it fails by cracks like, like shown here. Now this problem has been debated for 100 years in the literature and for 40 years by fracture mechanics. Nobody could fit it by cohesive crack model or linear elastic fracture mechanics, but Craig Ben model could. And now, uh, after Craig uh, gap test, we know why. So these are that actually, there are over 800 tests in the database of ACI. Uh, actually, to produce the database probably costs one billion worldwide. Uh, but unfortunately, most tests are not coordinated, they are not scaled. Well, not scale is very difficult to extract something from that. One, one, one guy, Teich, one of his students did such tests recently on three sizes perfectly scaled. Uh, large, medium, small. And then his data are plotted here in dimensionless coordinate. And what is seen that in dimensionless coordinates, all cracks follow the same path. Peak load is always here. So it's very systematic. And why? Uh, this cohesive uh, model doesn't work. Well, it's uh, look clear from the gap test. Uh, crack starts uh, at half of the maximum load here, or at the base, and propagates first as mode one, but then uh, load is transferred to a zone which is called compression strut on the, above the crack. And at the maximum load at this point, uh, you reach stress equal to the compression strength, so fracture energy actually at the moment of failure, maximum load is zero. No singularity. No, uh, no energy release rate. So how, how does it fail? It fails by compression, uh, by uh, compression shear fracture, which is a band of axial splitting cracks, which propagates from one side to the other, and there also the fact that it's, this area of energy is gross is by the side effect. Uh, so that's now finally with the crack gap test is fully understood. Now these are some simulations. Uh, so when you uh, simulated, you first get many cracks. This is in experiments. But then at maximum low, they localize to one dominant crack, always like this, like the red one. So this is one third of the maximum load. Uh, you see distributed cracks. At maximum load, you see this diagonal crack. Uh, you see it also with Grib and Russell model and uh, phase field. 
you, uh, you, you see completely different picture. It never gives this diagonal crack. Uh, uh, face field will never. It gives slipping here on the bar, which is not right. Uh, and that uh, max load this, this thing. So this is not correct. Now the same uh, same data on the other models. Uh, so uh, if a perinomics does this, this damage zone, that's why it gives totally wrong results. Uh, if you take perinomics grasso uh, uh, and bond associated, that gives uh, also totally wrong results. So these models are unacceptable. Another test, oh, wait a minute, uh, not another test, still shear effect. Uh, there's a size effect here. It actually beautifully follows the size effect law which I showed. The size effect law was, after long arguments, was put into ACI code. Every, every design must consider it uh, for, for beam shear, also for slab shear, or for footings. So you see this curve of the side effect formula is followed well by the test data. These are for different sizes of the beams. Uh, for, uh, for phase field, initially it seems to work, then it does not. This is wrong. Uh, Russell model, okay. Phase field rule is totally wrong, goes the opposite direction. Pre-dynamics, Grasso is uh, also wrong, uh, up and down. Uh, this pre uh, original one is also impossible, bone associated, even more wrong, it goes all the way down. And the only models that really work is are these uh, Kregman models, which can capture the correct parameters automatically. Now, if you look at the patterns uh, for different sizes now, size 200, 400, 800, you see the evolution is correct here, but for Grassel, there is, uh, this is not right for the right side. This is too far. It should be here, like this. Uh, so that's not, not perfect. It's just satisfactory. Face field, uh, you see patterns which are, don't correspond to what we see at all. Uh, these are the first models. Okay, perinomics. Perinomics bone associated, perinomics Grassel, again, totally wrong. Finally, double punch test. An old test done in Toronto by Marty in 1989. Uh, I prefer it to the Brazilian test because this test is cre clearly interpreted because the, uh, because the size effect Time does not change with size. In Brazilian test, you have Hertzian constant. We disturb that. We have strips on the on top, loading strips, which uh, not here. That follows perfectly the size effect law. This test, you see the blue curve and the test data of Marty, uh, and these data are very well matched by Grasso's model and also by uh, uh, Kerber model with M7 microplane. PFW is not bad, but it's a straight line. It cannot, straight line means uh, wrong energy release behavior. It cannot be straight line. And peridynamics uh, phase field basic is totally wrong. Also wrong, wrong slope, uh, somewhat wrong. And Kerben Grassel is also way off. The pattern is this. That's what's seen in experiments published in the Marty's paper. And uh, uh, face field, uh, uh, face field rule, uh, wrong results. If you go to the other models, perinomics Grasso, bond associated, wrong. This is totally wrong. Again, compared to what what I already showed. And in the diagram, uh, so this test uh, double punch gives for PD Grasso going up. That's totally contrary to, uh, to experiment. Perinomics goes the red one goes way down one associated even worse which is which is surprising right the only models are the which work out the other one now finally the gap test so i showed only comparison to kregman model with m7 now this is compared to other other models 
again, normalized fracture energy versus axial compression from non-compression. This is compression strength limit. So you see that, uh, okay, PFV gives insufficient increase and then it fails, it should not fail. Uh, Polydynamics goes wrong way, opposite, and it fails before, before the end. Uh, board associated Russell goes down and up. It's not really satisfactory. And, uh, okay. So, uh, all right. So, let me now discuss the last point I mentioned, objectivity. That's a basic requirement for any model. It must not depend on the human choice. If some parameters can be chosen arbitrarily and change the results, we cannot play with that to fit, fit the data. So in a phase field, it is the width of the band. And it has been shown that in the literature, actually, it has effect, significant effect on the response. If you change it, you fit results better or worse. And you see the behavior here load with the deflection for unearth specimen, unearth specimens, periodics against the horizon size has effect. It has to do largely with the boundary, that's uh, where it is aggravated. It's even without the boundary, it, it, there's a problem. So these problems will also have to be resolved if these should be viable models used in general practice, of course they are never used in practice. So let me sum up the results. So I showed here the 11 tests I discussed. And seven models, these are the columns. So Kerber model M7, uh, we rate as okay in all cases. Kerber Grassel is okay in five, uh, four cases. Remaining seven ones is not quite okay, satisfactory or fair. Very dynamics, uh, uh, phase field, uh, with Wu, uh, the, all the other models are wrong almost everywhere, with some exceptions that Wu is okay here, Bond Associates is okay here, and also here, and uh, Wu is poor, I mean not, not terrible, but also not satisfactory. So this is a dismal picture. We, these models are not usable in practice, they are fiction. But I would like to make a comment uh, on face view model, I think the basic idea is very interesting, it's clever. Frank for Marigo and uh, other extensions. And you must admit that it is the best model, face field, I didn't show it here, uh, for simulating curved LEFM cracks if there is no crack power stress. Unfortunately, not, there are not many situations with no crack power stress. That's a rarity. So where in practice would this matter? So all these cases, the process matters. Horizontal shear in columns and shear walls in earthquake, shear failure of reinforced concrete beams, pre-stress pressure vessel, containment failure, potential projectiles in concrete wall, exit speed of projectiles, safety of anchors in rock and concrete, safety of arch and gravity dams I didn't discuss, uh, uh, shear failure of composite beams, fracking, very important actually because Deep down, there is always a crack power stress and it affects poro mechanics, actually, and the transfer to the solid. Uh, hydraulic fracturing for geothermal energy, uh, similar to fracking, which is important for sequestration of CO2. Slow subjective growth of crack systems in geology. Growth of rupture earthquake falls, sea ice sheets, ice breaking, load bearing capacity, floating sea ice, fabric composite A-frames, tunnel or stove collapse, rock burst, borehole collapse, all these models cannot be solved with the existing periodics. God, what, what are they for? Uh, and they all have, uh, or most of them have, uh, some uh, effect of crack power stress. Actually, I didn't put here aircraft wing and all this uh, also. Now, the basic problem, why? Because these models were verified by selective use of data, two out of many and data which are convenient can be fitted by many models. This is misleading. Uh, Peridynamics, I, I believe, cannot be cured by a better constitutive model. The problem is deeper. So in closing, to make peridynamics viable, there's of course an important question. 
you would need to enhance lattice microstructure with particle rotations. You would need to introduce dilated and frictional interparticle shear. You would need to avoid particle skipping potential, which does not exist above atomic scale. You would need to fix boundary conditions somehow. I can discuss here, you would uh, have to fix wrong wave dispersion, which was shown in our paper six years ago. Fix the unobjectivity. So, it seems to me impossible unless the concept is changed. And if you change the concept, you end up with LDPM. Uh, our model at Northwestern, which Kusa and I started 20 years ago, he now greatly developed. Now, the phase three model, I am somewhat more optimistic. Uh, to make it viable, you need to account for fracture process on a finite width, already attempt by, attempted by Wu to some extent. Uh, uh, you would need to uh, introduce some uh, dependence on tensor damage. Without that, it's impossible. It's uh, not a scale, uh, not like quasi softening. You would need to overcome unobjectivity due to spurious choice. This might be possible. In fact, we are thinking about it, but so far we have no solution. Anyway, so for now, the M7 crackband model works well in all practical fracture cases and is predictive. So at the end, I would like to mention two things. First, uh, the coding of the microplane model can be downloaded from my website with instructions. These are papers given and described in the web gap test. Now, after a paper based on this lecture is accepted, we will post it in my website for everybody to download. And all the computer programs used uh, will be also posted in my website. So everybody can check it and uh, discuss it. So at the end, I must acknowledge two great collaborators. Well, uh, Don Mess, uh, formerly student at Northwestern and also postdoc, now faculty in Istanbul. He did all the tests on aluminum and calculation of the size effect, and uh, it was great work. Uh, Huang Guyen, well, Huang Guyen is a computational wizard. Not only that, he's also outstanding in the lab. He's also outstanding in mechanics. Without him, this paper would not have occurred. All this work he has done within about two months. And it's incredible. I could not believe it. Uh, so many thanks for this work. And he is about to defend his PhD uh, within, within, within a month or two. So with this, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Bajant, for the illuminating talk and the thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I'm Giuseppe Buscanera from Civil and Environmental, uh, from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Northwestern, and will be handling Q and A. So uh, I'm certain we have questions both from the room and from uh, the webinar. So I will be starting from uh, 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 questions in person. So please ask one question only, so we can. Uh, 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 spread the Q&A as much as possible. Is there anybody who has questions from the room? Nobody, everybody. Yep, yep, please. Uh, yeah, that's of course. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, yes, I can repeat the question. So the question is, how many uh, tests do you need to parameterize the MP7 uh, model? So M7 model was fitted only on material tests, on small specimens, which are basically the size of the process zone, so they can show damage distributed. And in our paper with Fairhoon, we have 21 different types of tests for no other material of such variety. Uh, Uniaxial, biaxial, triaxial, proportional loading, non proportional loading, uh, uh, various uh, cyclic loading, uh, various histories, uh, uh, the 20, 21 different types. And that was enormous work. That was actually, uh, that took Ferhun K, uh, at the time my student, it would take him one year. Uh, one year of uh, basically intuitive guessing and optimization always at the end, uh, optimization programs. 
So it's uh, for a complicated material science, it's concrete, lots of work. It's, now we are working to get it for aluminum, microplane model. It exists for shale. There was extension of concrete that actually works, I think, quite, very well. So much more limited data, of course. Uh, it has been for laced clay, uh, uh, clay creep for sandstone. Uh, so uh, we are trying for, for composite. So uh, it's lots of work, but once you have it, it works. Thank you. So let's move to uh, one question from the webinar. I will be reading, this is from Horatio Spinoza. Um, so, uh, so if I understood well, CBGR described well several experimental configurations, but is less accurate on some. Do you have some insights on the possible reasons? CB Grassel, right? Yeah. yeah some. Well, it's, uh, you know, it has only two loading surfaces, and I think there's a difference with microplane model. Microplane model can capture phenomena on one orientation. For example, if you have loading surfaces, what is friction? Well, normally they consider friction is uh, the sensitivity of uh, shear or deviatory deformation to I1, or hydrostatic pressure. This is not shear, it's because shear happens already on distinct planes, not everywhere. It, uh, and that can be captured only by the microwave model, where you have, in the microwave model, we know what is the direction of shear. In uh, any tensile model, you don't. Friction is not dependence of uh, deviatoric deformation on, uh, on hydrostatic pressure. That's sort of global approximate uh, characterization. So I think that's the main reason. Thank you. I'll follow up with another question from Professor Espinoza related to the previous one. Uh, it is also about the parametrization of the model. Uh, how were the various model parameters parametrized and validated? It's a very important step before attempting description of fracture in the presence of damage. This is perhaps consistent to the previous question, but a bit across the various models you showed. Uh, so, for example, for the size effect, we optimize them for the, uh, for the smallest size so that we can compare the curves. And then we saw see the divergence, but they, of course, in absolute values, they diverge also for the first side, but it's not so clear. So we always optimize something for comparability. Okay. Uh, and, uh, okay, we could be discussing more detail, but uh, fitting some basic test, uh, in this phase of model, that was involved, but. Yeah. I think that's basically answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience before switching to any other from the webinar? Victor, do we have other questions from there? So here there are two questions from Nakib Rahimi. Uh, first, you didn't discuss the computational efficiency of the model. Do you think microplane models are computationally more efficient than uh, peridynamics or phase field? Well, I would say they are as, as efficient as craig Bell model with a standard constitutive model. There is one phenomenon. M7 on one element runs about 20 times longer than a standard model. But computational cost increases quadratically with the num number of unknowns but uh, in the, in the cost of model linearly. So for example, at, at, uh, what, uh, at West, in our ERDC in Vicksburg, they are running a microplane model on systems of 40, 50 million fun elements. And they tell me there is no difference in the running time compared to standard models, because it's overwhelmed by the system, of course. So that's one point to, to note. Uh, uh, other questions, uh, I don't know, Hong Guyen could answer them better because we were running, <laughs> we were running the examples. I rely totally yeah, on if, if you If you want to... You want to uh, say any comment, Hong? Uh, yeah, just uh, as a, uh, like, uh, executor of, of uh, this project, I think um, overall, it is not fair, like, if we, you can compare different models on different platform, yeah, because I'm, you, I'm running uh, crack band on Abacus, uh, Peridynamics uh, on Trillinos and Phase Fuse, 
uh, on due to an abacus as well. But uh, from my point of view, because phase view, usually people use it with like um, uh, static general. So it needs to go uh, for in several iterations. And then the conversion is issue would be another problem. And then you have to refine the mesh. So I would say phase view would be like the least computationally, uh, I'm sorry, uh, efficient uh, in this list. And uh, for peridynamics models and crack band models, so for peridynamics, because uh, the, the conventional peridynamics model on, runs with like a simple material models. Uh, so it, uh, it is fast, but it's not uh, accurate. And then the peridynamic Grasso and peridynamic uh, bond associated version of the Grasso, it has to be run with the Grasso's model. So it adds up another layer of uh, computational expense. So I would say like the crack band right now, it, it seems to be like, like the efficient uh, models to run. Okay, very well. Thank you, Hank. There was a, another follow-up question by Nakib Rahimi. It is about the material used for validation. So uh, basically the validation uh, shown the, in your presentation focused on concrete. And the question is, would the conclusion be a comparable uh, uh, in this comparison between crack band, uh, peridynamics and phase field for other materials like PMMA and the metals? Now we have very few data, few data for that. And I think the comp uh, comparison, but we have not run it. So we will put a more complicated model, obviously you will uh, run a longer time, but the material model does not matter for large systems. That's, uh, that's obvious, uh, well known in computational mechanics. Yeah. It matters on small systems, but then they are not important anyway. Uh, now we have not done much on other models. We have done some work on shale. Uh, we have this ferrocylic anisotropic microplane model. So that was run in Northwestern, uh, but I don't have extensive enough experience. It's, uh, it was feasible on our Actually, small problems, even our desktop powerful PC computer or workstation. Yeah, for, for most of these, we use actually supercomputer for most of these present calculations. Thank you. It doesn't look like there are additional questions from the audience. So I'll ask, uh, well, there are two more and then I'll close from uh, um, the webinar. So one by Arash Samayi. Could you comment on the effect of moisture content and porosity on the crack growth? And this factor might affect deviations from experimental data? Yeah, this is of course very important, but uh, uh, brings another dimension. Moisture content affects creep, affects uh, fracture, affects everything, especially uh, slow fracture. Uh, we consider standard testing where specimen is cured in the lab, this is always done so for uh, two weeks, uh, at least two weeks, uh, uh, maybe one month. The typical testing is one month for all these tests, I think, in concrete. And then it is exposed in the lab for a few days for the setup. So it dries partially, and I think it is comparable for the other tests. There's been this debate in ACI committee how to, uh, whether to consider that. It was concluded, first of all, we don't have information, but it's much similarity because the tests are done similar way everywhere. You, you don't cure for one week and then expose it to drying for a year. Uh, and if you do, you have to do special adjustments and we do, of course, for, uh, for the drying and, and change of aging and chemical, chemical hardening. So this is a good question, but uh, I don't think it affects these results significantly because of the procedures are usually the same. Thank you. So last question, this is by our colleague, John Rodniki. Can you say a bit more about what kind of material parameters go into the phase field and peridynamic models? How are they calibrated only by a single test? And more specifically, do they have some explicit fracture mechanics criterion built in? Well, in peridynamics, uh, you have this bond, which is defined as a central force, which is linear and breaks at a certain strain. And it breaks suddenly, so the area under this uh, up and down is fraction energy of the bond, right? Now the sudden break, of course, is not right. It, uh, there is always a nonita before the peak, so uh, uh, that's what I assume. We to took what's, what's the normally done. If periodics could be refined, introducing some more sophisticated characterization, 
I don't think it would change the picture. It would change the results somewhat, but it still not be not be matching the data. Yeah. Yeah. So Hong wants to add something. I'm just want to ask. Uh, I'm sorry to add something quickly. So uh, the calibration uh, depends on the model. Like the basic phase field model only have one scalar. So you can only use one test uh, to 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 fit it. Like the the, the size effect test or, or or the tensile test. For all the uh, complicated model, you you need more experiments to to calibrate it. And in in each type of experiment presented, there are some material calibration tests done, and then we use those as uh, basics for uh, uh, parameterization of the models. And because uh, the two uh, periodynamics model is uh, you use the same um, uh, Crassos model, so basically we uh, use the same set of parameters. And something Professor Bajan, Bajan has not mentioned is uh, to give the H model uh, uh, the best chance to survive. I always use the horizon size in the periodynamic models to be equal to the element size uh, of the crack band so that they distribute, I'm sorry, they dissipate the uh, same amount of uh, energy. Okay, good point. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you, Professor Bajan, for the uh, very nice talk. Thank you, everybody, for attending remotely or in person. And please join me once again, thanking our speaker. <laughs>